Welcome and good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this because, uh, as you'll see, my company is uh, is uh, in the, on the cusp of building a first new refinery in uh, North America in 30 years. Um, what, what I want to talk about today is, uh, is this agenda. Keith, you had some real good stuff and I agree with almost everything you said. And I'll try not to repeat uh, what, what Keith has already, already said. Tell you a little bit about Northwest and talk about what the information means to both operations and maintenance. Talk about the handover and transfer and uh, turnovers. What does it look like? An internet of things, interoperability, and finally looking uh, back to the future. Um, just before I do that, I'll pose a question. When I did a master's back in the 70s, I took a course from management science. And guess what? It was called Information Systems for Management back in the uh, 70s. And of course, the prof posed a, 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 a knowledgeable graduate students as to uh, what is information. We had lots of uh, definitions of it, but he came up with the best definition I have ever heard, even yet. And that was information is data that is used in making a decision. Otherwise, it's just data. And information changes every hour, every day, every minute for every one of us because we're all involved in making different decisions and we need different data for whatever decision we're trying to make, whether it's an operator trying to set the uh, pump around flow on a group tower or whether it's an executive trying to decide uh, whether or not to uh, approve a contract. Different information. Information can be documents, it can be drawings, it can be numbers. How do we manage all that? As Keith said, it's ever growing and it's coming at us bigger and faster than it ever before. Northwest, <clears throat> we've just been approved to build a bitumen refinery. We will be taking bitumen from oil sands producers and processing that directly into saleable product, primarily diesel and diluent, which Alberta is short of both. Uh, we will not use cokers. We will, not, we will use hydrocrack, uh, um, a general uh, NACRA kind of hydrocracker or a Rosette hydrocracker. And the stuff that the hydrocrackers can't crack, we will then put to a gasifier. The gasifier will break that down to elemental hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Hydrogen goes back to the hydrocrackers and we'll use a Repsol unit to extract the carbon dioxide, purify it, compress it, liquefy it, and Alberta's building a carbon trunk line into central Alberta so that the uh, uh, oil sands producers and refineries like ourselves can then pump carbon dioxide down to decline in oil reservoirs in Alberta. It gets re-injected back into the ground for enhanced oil recovery. So we, it's the first refinery that has been designed with carbon capture and storage inherent from the beginning. Uh, we, can, we call it the first green refinery in the world. Uh, we'll have the lowest carbon footprint in the world of the products that we make. Uh, the first phase has been approved for about 5.7 billion. It's, uh, we're into the ground, leveling the site in spring as soon as the thaw hits. And the uh, partnership is actually a 50-50 partnership between Northwest Upgrading, which is a small startup company that conceived us of, of this idea back in 2004 and uh, developing ever since and Canadian Natural Resources, which is a large oil and gas producer in Alberta. Uh, we've grown, I joined the company about two and a half years ago, I was probably the 29th guy. Uh, we're now about 20, 325 staff and, and, and adding more every day and we'll be adding about a thousand contractors as we proceed into this project and at the uh, peak of the project we'll have probably about 5,000 people on the site. The site is northeast of Edmonton, Alberta, away, it's about 45 kilometers. Uh, there's a, a rendition there of the, uh, uh, of the site. It's across the road from the Agram uh, Fertilizer Plant, just south of the town of Redwater, and that's the North Saskatchewan River running through, and on the other side of the North Saskatchewan River is the Shell Canada Spotford Complex, which, by the way, was the, uh, was the last new refinery that was built in North America, and I was with Shell at the time to help start that place, place up in 1984. Wow, that made a difference. 
I hope you heard all that. <laughs> I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> uh, turn down the volume a little bit, I think. Okay, back in uh, February 2011, uh, Alberta approved the BRIC program. That stands for Bridgman Royalties in Kind. And that means that as of 2014, the uh, Crown, we call the government the Crown at times, will uh, allow oil sands producers the option of paying their royalties, which are taxes on production, uh, in bitumen barrels instead of cash. So once the Crown has a bitumen barrel, what does it do with it? Well, you can only do two things with a bitumen barrel. You can sell it to somebody else who can do something with it, or you can process it. Uh, the uh, Crown has uh, selected us to do both. We will market the uh, uh, crowns bitumen for them in 2014 and we will also build the plant to process those bitumen barrels into saleable products. 75% of the feedstock at 50,000 barrels a day comes from the crown, the, the brick program. Uh, the uh, oil sands bitumen comes from uh, Fort McMurray, Cold Lake and Peace River. So it's a mix depending on who's paid their taxes in bitumen barrels. 25% um, of the feedstock will come from CNRL, our partner. The project was approved in November this year, or just this past year, so uh, we will be, as I said, in the, in the leveling the site and getting into the ground in the spring. And uh, startup is forecasted and scheduled to be the mid-2016 where we'll put first oil in. So uh, the diesel factory, it's called the Sturgeon Refinery, takes its name from the county that it's, uh, it's located in, will uh, we'll build and operate this uh, world-class Refinery, we're going to set the standard for environmental performance with a carbon, cap a carbon dioxide capture and a enhanced oil recovery, uh, I can't say that word, storage scheme. Uh, and uh, because we are not using a coker, we'll not produce any coke, you use about, lose about 20% of the yield to coke uh, when you do, and so they will maximize the yield and minimize the waste. Uh, interesting enough, carbon dioxide, we don't vent the atmosphere there, and, very little of it, so and it's actually, we sell it as a product. So we actually get money for that. Uh, as I mentioned, direct conversion from the bitumen directly to ultra, primarily ultra low sulfur diesel and diluent. Um, not producing a synthetic crude like, a, uh, like the other oil sands uh, upgraders do. Um, the f it's actually permitted for three phases. Once we get the first phase built and operating, we can then move to uh, cloning it and cloning it again. Total capacity is therefore forecast at 150,000 barrels of bitumen a day, and that would re, uh, translate to about 225,000 barrels of uh, feed a day. Because the bitumen comes in with uh, mixed with diluent, of course, you can't pipe bitumen itself. You have to mix it with a solvent, and that's kind of like a gasoline. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the risk is uh, of the investment and, uh, and, the, and the cost is borne by the two partners. There's a 30-year processing agreement with the uh, Crown and with uh, CNRL. Uh, they own the feedstock and they own the product and we'll get a, a processing fee. And so we're actually maximizing the value of Alberta's resources. And the oil sands resources and we're turning all that uh, terribly dirty oil, which is a terrible misnomer, into a very clean product at uh, have low carbon footprint and uh, minimum cost. Um, on to information management. My colleague Bruce Taylor in, uh, in Suncor Energy, and I used to work for them and worked with Bruce for a number of years. I love his quote. He says, if I can personally afford technology, it allows me to locate and guide me to a specific restaurant in a city that I've never been in. While listing tonight's off the menu specials and adding my name to their wait list, why the heck can't I have similar technology will as easily direct me to and possibly identify a pump and automatically aggregate all its associated data that's available when I'm on the job? Why is it so easy for the consumer electronics world and it's so difficult for us? And Jeffrey Moore says, really that in another way. Why is it that in terms of technology I feel so powerful as a consumer and so lame as an employee? Why the hell have we been spending so much on technology and yet have so much frustration to show for it? And that's what I hear from executives all over the place, including my own. Here's a real scenario. We're doing, we're running uh, whatever production you run in a, in, a, in a refinery, petrochemical plant, and the operator out there has discovered a problem with a critical pump. No spare on that, that circuit. You might have a bypass. 
Um, and the, when he looks at the field readings, he, if he doesn't have it on his handheld device, which uh, Bruce is talking about right now across the hall, um, he's probably talking to the control room and uh, they're saying, well, the, the flow and the pressure and the temperature are such and such and uh, that thing's vibrating and it's hot and uh, geez, it's going to fail pretty soon. What do we do? What does operations want to do? What does maintenance want to do? Well, usually those are diametrically opposed. If op operations has to meet a pipeline schedule in all likelihood, and so they want to keep that doggone thing running until they got that, uh, that uh, uh, shipping tank full of uh, regular gasoline uh, and uh, to meet the volume and the schedule on the piping. What does maintenance want to do? Maintenance wants to take the gun thing down right away before it, open, it uh, vibrates itself apart and ruins everything. And, the, and besides, they haven't got a spare in the warehouse. They might have a spare in pillar, hopefully. So two diametrically opposed. So you've got an argument going on. How do you handle that? What's the work processes and how can we do that better? And what information do we need in order to make that decision? So ask yourself, you owner operators, in your plants, can your operators easily and dynamically discover which equipment has outstanding work orders, intuitively find notifications of work orders from the field, or identify which assets are your bad actors? Can your process engineers easily distinguish between a bad actor, bad materials, and an operational problem when they're looking at a process upset and what caused it? Can your process engineers correlate asset changes with process data? Usually reside in two different systems that never talk to each other. Can reliability and asset be determined freely at the component assembly or area or you know, any other uh, level that you've broken your plant into? Can the probability of an asset's availability for the next production schedule be easily accessible and comprehended and feasible? Can conflicting operational maintenance missions, just like I talked about, be avoided or quickly mitigated? And can the data be entered once and only once, and there's only one version of the truth. That's what we're after. I'll bet you every one of you say, uh-uh, doesn't happen in our plant. It certainly hasn't happened in any of the plants that I've been in in four decades in uh, three major oil companies in Canada. I've been working on this for a long time, and I worked on it primarily uh, you know, through the process control environment, but we've got all these silos. And every refinery and every petrochemical plant operates basically with these functional groups. And the information is usually scattered because each one of those silos is using a, usually a different application, different software, and that software has never been designed to talk to each other or to get information or data from each other. That results in siloed information lacking the context and difficult to access, promotes inconsistent uh, KPIs, key parameter uh, indicators and measurements, and whatever your, your plant uh, management is looking for in order to, uh, to monitor and uh, control the operation of that plant. And reports are usually backwards looking, driving the car by looking in the rear view mirror instead of uh, using uh, predictive prognostics to uh, see what's out the front window. And it starts with, as Keith was talking about, really the turnover of data from the, when the plant was built. And this is the process that we're, we're looking at and we're at the starting end of this. So we've, we've done the DBM and we're, we've uh, done the EDS and now we're into detailed engineering. And there will be a turnover and it won't be one handover. It will be multiple turnovers of data to us and it'll go back and forth multiple times. And finally, we'll accept it for as designed. And then we'll accept it, approve it for as construction. And finally, we need to uh, do have the as built. And that's really what commissioning needs to start up the plant. And they have to be involved with it all along. So the real uh, the contractual handover occurs probably just about the time you're ready to put feet in. That's when your, your, your commissioning people say, yep, we got it good enough, it's ready to go. By the way, th that also says, there's usually a punch list half a mile long that says, well, the contractor still got to fix up all this stuff even after we put feet in. And then it gets turned over to operations and maintenance to run it. And that's where the uh, transfer of, of uh, care, custody, and control takes place. 
and you pay the contractor off and send them away and I hope we don't have to fix it. Uh, we're trying to avoid that. Every project I've been involved with, basically send the contractor away and say, okay, you're out of here, we'll pay you. Now we go in there and we'll fix it so we can start it up and run it. Want to avoid that, so what we were really trying to drive and get towards is a harmonious work environment when we've got this thing started up. That's always adapting, improving, and continuous improvement, and that you have the uh, people working on a collaborative and cooperative and, a, and an event-driven fashion that's always auditable. And that is now attainable. Uh, here's an operations example that kind of relates to that pump. So that uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, remote handheld out in the, the, the unit, which is very e uh, easy technology to implement now, can be, uh, can be used by the operator. The, there's a several applications accessed, and he out there right at the pump uh, wants to call up the procedures and any documentation he needs, uh, maintenance on the pump, and uh, what incidents have been around that area. He then wants to get the hist work order history, the notifications that are open, specifications, create the, a notification that this pump needs attention by maintenance. Create the notification in whatever maintenance system you got and then send it back and then that has to be disseminated back to your operator logs, your, uh, your maintenance system, the uh, process management uh, uh, safety system, and the other systems that need that information so that the work can be done in an effective manner and can be scheduled properly. So you really need a, we're looking for an intuitive, seamless environment. Why can't we get there? Now the key challenges has usually been the integration of these systems. And what we really need now is a system of systems. And so, what is the unifying master data that, the model and where does it reside? Chevron's are using a, a, a data warehouse. We intend to you leave the uh, information and the data in the system. It was its native system, but make sure that we can access it any, from anywhere. You know, when my wife looks at my workshop, She's got a very good point. She says, you know, Cliff, if you can't find it, you ain't got it. And guess what? Yeah, data that is needed for information must be searchable. If an EPC gives me PDFs and Excel spreadsheets, those aren't necessarily searchable. Yeah, they're computer readable, but they're not necessarily searchable. So we need it to be searchable and the uh, the, the integration uh, has been worked out so that it is available now. It is being developed. What does the information look like to the operators? This is a display out of Suncor's uh, Denver refinery that basically shows the dashboard. And here you can see the safety information, the alerts, the logs, the shift logs, the KPIs, the parameters are being generated sales information, power usage, the best practices, the key operating parameters. Here's the inventory in the tankage, in our case, HR information, maintenance and inspections, and finally lab quality. That can all be aggregated now and integrated. That's a front-end integration. What I was talking about before was a back-end iteration. And if you look at that, that uh, compressor, the compressor or that uh, centrifugal pump, this may be what you're actually looking at, uh, or you can put on one screen so you can see all the information you need about how that pump is operating, what you need to do to maintain it. And it's interoperable, that stuff is coming from different systems, and the information is being exchanged at the back end between the, uh, the systems of, uh, of record. From a maintenance point of view, here's a display that basically shows all the information needed around that asset, even a process flow diagram with the key operating parameters so you can see what actually is happening in that part of the plant. Interoperability. We've needed it for years, we've been asking it for years, we're finally getting to the point where we can do it. Uh, there's a collaboration called Open O&M, uh, started with five standards bodies, really now added a six with its ISO. And uh, these guys merged the standards for 
Uh, you see ISA there for uh, the old instrument side of America, Mimosa for machine information, WVF batch information, OPC you know is the uh, OLA for process control foundation, and the OAGI which is a discrete parts manufacturing. And that thing, that strategy along with ISO fills in that uh, white space in the middle. It becomes an internet of things so that information can then be transformed from the engineering environment, which looks like that for that pumper compressor, to something that's more representative to the process control and operations of the world. And uh, on the bottom is the logos of the uh, organizations that are active in that. And by the way, I'm the uh, chair of the Owner Operators Leadership Council for this. And any of you owner operators who want to know more about it, ping me. I'll be happy to tell you, and uh, we need more owner operators to uh, be involved and to drive this thing forward because this is exactly what we need, and we're asking the suppliers to write the adapters so that we can then access information from any application to any other application seamlessly without doing direct code programming. So when you actually start with a process unit, you really start with a conceptual design. I. Uh, we, I couldn't get one. I knew, uh, uh, worked for a startup company. We don't have one. Uh, nobody would give me uh, uh, an engineering data set uh, because it's all proprietary and secret. Can't let anybody else look at it. So I said, finally, well, let's do a debutinizer tower because almost every refinery and petrochemical plant has one. So drew a debutinizer on the board, turned that over to uh, uh, our engineering friends. And this is what it becomes like in an engineering data set. That's actually done by Worley Parsons. That's the debutinizer tower, fully uh, piped up and fully uh, instrumented, full data engineering data set behind it. And we have then put that into actual an industry pilot, which has been sanctioned by ISO. TC tech stands for Technical Committee 184, which is Industrial Automation Working Group 6. And this is the first phase of that uh, headed towards the technical specification. We demonstrated this by, we gave that, uh, uh, that uh, debutinizer tower to our key engineering suppliers, Aviva, Bentley, and Intergraph. And they then worked it up in their own systems, pumped out the data in ISO 15926 format. University of South Australia trans wrote code to transform that, it's standard code and then gave it to the Mimosa registry, which keeps track of where every datum is in its source system, put it onto an uh, enterprise service bus on steroids, which well, in this case was IBM's uh, IIC, Integrated uh, uh, Information Integrated Core, Integrated Information Core, and then used that, coming out of that in standard format to provision and define the tags of a PI data historian. That's the first time, I think, in the history of mankind that's, that's ever been done without it being touched by human hands and without it being manipulated by human brains. And it's, uh, the, as you see, the ISO 15926 reference data, which Keish mentioned, is, uh, forms uh, the uh, foundation of that. And there is, uh, we recorded the demo that we did back in, uh, I think it was September, wasn't it, in uh, ISA Automation in, uh, here in Orlando. It was ISA automation here in land over in the convention center. Uh, so you can actually call that up and uh, play that demo. It uh, takes about an hour. And you see the, uh, how every one of the people that did that uh, uh, sequence of work describe it. So back to the future. When you look at information management and you look at the uh, organization performance versus the learning, which I've heard a lot of a talk about today, um, you know, we started out way back at the, uh, the left-hand side, which was uh, do nothing, be happy with paper, uh, you know, muddle along the best you can, search for stuff the best you can, take hours to find stuff. So, and, and going up that, uh, that chart to get the more reactive and planned approach, I would like to get Northwest into the uh, proactive approach and hopefully after we get everything sorted out and lined out and running that we can get into an operational excellence mode. So thank you. That's the story of information management as I see it in the operations and maintenance world, but also links back to the EPC world and the engineering world and the project world.